welcome to this GSMA IoT web talk on 5G private and dedicated networks for Industry 4.0. So we have a fantastic lineup of companies um, for this web talk today from both the mobile and the manufacturing and production industries. From the mobile side, we have Vodafone, Orange, KPN and Verizon. And from the manufacturing and production industry, we have Ford, Lacroix Group, Shell and DHL. So a really fantastic uh, lineup. So looking forward to the session. So on the agenda today, following a quick introduction by myself, we will have Chris White from Ford UK and Mark Sauter from Vodafone presenting on creating the 5G factory of the future. Following that, we will have a second keynote from Ronan Labras of Orange and Stefan Gervais of Lacroix Group, and they will be presenting on 5G IoT for Connected Factories 4.0. And following our two keynotes, we will have a panel discussion on 5G private and dedicated network deployments. That will be hosted by my colleague, Steve Doyle of the GSMA. And our guests on the panel will be Alexander Dow of DHL, Jakob Groot of KPN, Lov Kerr of Verizon, and Marian Bazushin of Shell. So starting out with some forecasts for um, IoT and Industry 4.0, DSMA Intelligence expect there to be 2 billion Industry 4.0 IoT connections in 2025, and that's an increase from 660 million today, so about three times um, in 2025, uh, the numbers of today. We expect 18% um, of uh, those connections to be cellular. And on the revenue side, we expect about 10% of um, Industry 4.0 IoT revenues to come from connectivity. And the remaining 90% will be from applications, platforms, and services. Of the total market revenue, as a base case, um, if continuing on the current path, we expect mobile operators gain about 14% of the total market. Moving on to today's topic of private and dedicated networks. So I think the really exciting thing about 5G is that there are so many different deployment options to suit different enterprises, strategies, needs, and use cases. So this shows a range of different deployment options from fully public networks on the left-hand side to private networks on the right-hand side. So looking at, on starting at the left-hand side with the public network, there's an opportunity, for example, for operators to provide improved um, SLAs and customer service on the public network and also, also to utilize edge computing um, on the public network. Looking in the middle, there are some really interesting new options when it comes to network slicing and providing dedicated network resources so for example, through network slicing, network resources can be reserved for the use of a particular enterprise, but um, those network resources can also be customized. For example, the uplink and downlink um, requirements for the use cases employed by the enterprise and also edge computing facilities can be installed on premises. So even with the use of the public network, it's possible to create a dedicated um, portion of that network for the exclusive use of an enterprise. And looking at the right-hand side, uh, private networks, there's also some different options here. So for example, private networks can be deployed using operator spectrum, using private, shared, or, or unlicensed spectrum as well. So there's a whole range of different um, deployment options available. And this is why we've sort of broadened um, our view um, of this area from not just being private networks, but looking at dedicated networks as well. So use of the public network, but um, tailoring that to, to the needs of a particular enterprise. And if mobile operators can, um, can offer this broad range of services and, and the customization, we expect a significant uplift in revenue potential. We have just released a paper on 5G private and dedicated networks, which is available on our website, um, which goes into much more detail on the different deployment options, considerations, um, when uh, thinking about whether to deploy a private or dedicated network and security and many other areas as well. So I would encourage uh, those of you interested in this area to uh, go to that link there and uh, download a copy. 
So I am now excited to introduce Mark Salter from Vodafone and Chris White from Ford, who will present our first keynote on creating the 5G factory of the future. Yeah, Aruna, um, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and also uh, inviting us to be part of that IoT uh, web talk. So a super exciting topic, that's for sure. Um, and uh, it's going to be a pleasure to um, present the Vodafone Ford uh, case with you. So therefore, I'm also uh, happy that Chris White from Ford will uh, join me um, on this presentation in the next 15 minutes. If you go to the next slide, please, and you can jump over that. So what we want to cover in this uh, brief 15 minutes session is actually, you know, quickly talk about the 5G private and dedicated networks and the benefits. Um, we will show the various deployment models that are possible and some of the key features that we see. Then we will actually spend majority of the time um, on the case study um, where Chris will actually talk about um, what they do with um, mobile private networks uh, within Ford. So basically, you know, all the companies and customers uh, we talk to, they have a program for digital transformation or industry 4.0. Um, and for example, in the manufacturing space, you know, this includes um, connecting industrial robots, also includes uh, using computer vision, for uh, quality control, for example. Then um, lots is happening actually also in transportation and logistics, where you have ports, but also um, logistic warehouses. And here, uh, these companies, they, they trial and use automated guided uh, vehicles. Um, they also, we have a case with a port, for example, where we use and support uh, remotely control of the cranes. And then there is a huge um, segment in energy and utilities, which also includes mining, where actually health and safety of the workers is one of the key use cases there, and also uh, sensor monitoring and surveillance drones, just to name a few. Uh, so all these um, capabilities and use cases, they require um, highly reliable, high-performing wireless networks. So we know what our customers say is that often Wi-Fi is not stable enough or doesn't provide the scalability that is required. A fixed connection is not flexible or um, or is just not feasible if you think about um, automated guided vehicles that move around. And then there are also privacy and security and latency requirements that are typically not supported by a, a public by the public network. So therefore, um, from our perspective. A, a mobile private network um, will address all these requirements and, and meet these needs. And that's actually, you know, providing a dedicated um, network that provides guaranteed uh, service levels and security and combine that with the power of 4G and 5G with the um, increased bandwidth, for example, that you get from there and also with um, dedicated MEC. Uh, that provides then uh, the additional um, low latency and security requirements. So by combining those three components, uh, you can actually get a very, very powerful solution to enable all the different use cases that I talked to before. So that obviously uh, raises the question, so what is a mobile private network? And often, uh, you know, when you talk to 10 people, you get at least 11 different definitions and opinions. Um, so from our perspective, you know, a mobile private network is a secure mobile communications network for a specific company site. Typically, you have all the components that you would um, typically expect on the public network as well, like um, the mobile core, uh, radio access network, for example, right? But in this case, they're dedicated for uh, the specific use cases of that company or that site, which means actually that um, the devices of the company, they can exclusively access this network. So that the infrastructure um, is usable exclusively by these devices. And so therefore the enterprise can control and authorize which devices connect to these dedicated network resources. Um, we quickly wanna highlight the different 
uh, possible versions of a mobile private network that we see from a connectivity perspective. And probably there are also more that are just in between, but from our perspective, these are the three main um, architecture options that you have. So starting from the left, um, we call this a dedicated mobile private network, which is basically you know, a physical standalone mobile private network. You, you literally take all the key components that you would expect in a public network and just parachute that package into and that solution onto a, a customer site. This gives you, you know, a short quality of service. All the data stay on the campus and you know, gives 100% control through the enterprise and the customer. Um, what it doesn't support is interworking with the public network. And in some cases, that might be actually the intention because you want to have really an isolated network with no, um, let's call it interference or connection to any public network where you have shared resources and, and other um, users have access to. Then in the center, you have the hybrid mobile network where you have the physical private network elements deployed in conjunction with the public network. Um, here um, you have um, some components reused from the public core network, for example, radio still 100% dedicated. And that uh, gives you, in addition um, to the dedicated MPN, also into working with the public network. For example, if you think about a port um, where you have containers coming into the port and leaving the port, uh, that's important that you then also can monitor those containers when they uh, leave the port and then um, connect to the public network. And then um, to the right, you have a virtual MPN where you provide quality of service in the vote of a network, for example, through network slicing. Here you completely use the public core, but you have a private slice on the radio access side where you then carve out a certain part of the spectrum which is dedicated to the customer, still gives you the uh, assured quality of service and the interworking with the public network, but certainly has then some limitations on the data that do not completely stay on the campus and also the customer um, loses a little bit of the control over the network. And uh, from our perspective, the virtual MPN is particularly interesting to uh, smaller companies, right? Um, because it's a very cost effective um, solution. Um, with that, that's um, you know an introduction. So let's bring this to life. And um, it's actually a great pleasure for us to be working with Ford, a pioneer in the automotive space, um, who is using this in the production of electric vehicles. And therefore, please welcome Chris White. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and, and thank you to all at Vodafone for this uh, fantastic opportunity for your help and support in uh, us being able to look at 5G within our company. Okay, so um, the fourth industrial revolution in, uh, the, um, isn't really the only uh, big um, change that we face, of course, in our industry. Um, we have a significant challenge right there of our own. This year, we'll electrify uh, 14 of our vehicles. Um, and so there's a massive change for us in terms of what we make and, and, and of course, then how we make it. So we're going to flip a lot of our footprint around. And as we do that, we're really interested in looking at different ways of building cars and effectively the factory of the future. So what would we like from that? Um, so here are some uh, current and future states um, that, that, that exist within uh, my world today. So today, um, we have a very well connected factory, but it's hardwired. So all of our data connections are, very, are fixed and they take a long time to maintain and validate. And what we want in the future is that we have safer, faster connections um, that we can actually validate before we get the equipment into the factory. Um, the equipment equally can't be moved around very quickly, being hardwired, and it can't certainly can't move around during production. So we don't have you know, mobile assets moving around our factory and actually making changes quickly, which is what, what it's all about, is something that we struggle with from a data perspective. Also, the equipment is becoming more and more complex, the processes are becoming more complex, and we need to have access from people outside of our factories to help us. And of course, that poses a security risk. So what we're looking for is a technology that can allow us to have the access to our equipment, but without any of those risks. 
a lot of what we do with our data happens out there on the shop floor locally. So the data, data, the decision making is dispersed across the shop floor on shop floor computers. Typically, they're very difficult to control. So what we'd like to have is more robust, manageable, centralized remote computing. And of course, as well as that, with all of that data existing out on the shop floor, we have lots of limitations with the amount of data we can keep and store. And so what we'd like to do is be able to centralize and increase the amount of data that we accommodate. So why do we need that? What's the key drivers within Ford? Well, the top one is probably the driver of today. You can see from the right, it's pretty easy in the auto industry to hit the headlines when you have a bad launch. And often when you scratch the surface of those launches, lots of it is about not knowing what's going on. And whilst we do have very good connected machines and the connected equipment, often that takes too long to get in place. And by that point, we've normally found a problem ourselves. So that's the key driver that we'd say, say today. But of course, as we look to the factory of the future, all the others are part of that, of what we call IoT enablers. So what are we doing in terms of the work with Vodafone here in Ford, in Dunton, in Essex? We're taking some key processes and we're looking to we're looking at those um, with regard to deploying 5G. So we have laser welding, which is a key process that we, we, we use within electric vehicles, both in terms of welding batteries together, but also welding the circuitry we have inside um, motors. They're called hairpins. And you can see there that there's a significant amount of data processing involved that happens very fast. Um, and that's, uh, that's a clear area for us to, to, to deploy a new method of managing data. So these are complex applications with large amounts of data that we want to process very quickly. So we've, collected, we, we've selected laser welding within our facility. And what are the key things that we want to do? So briefly, we want to look at those machines and understand how they're performing. So we need to understand whether they're blocked, starved, in fault, so that we can understand across a wide factory exactly where our bottlenecks are and where our issues are. Over time, though, we need to understand those, those, those pieces of equipment and how they're wearing and how they're performing. So then we need to also do condition monitoring to tell us more about the equipment and when it may need some maintenance. And when it does, we often need remote support. So how do we get those experts into the factory at times of the day that perhaps aren't convenient to people, or as we're finding today, very difficult to get people to travel to us anyway. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, we want to assure the quality of our products. So actually collecting data, mainly vision data from our, from our products and understanding and, and checking that data. So they're the use cases, the, the, the themes that we're working through. Obviously within the space of this project, we're looking for nice, clear use cases that we can work upon. And, that, and that's why we've got the questions at the bottom there. So the project's about five months old and, and, and it's a real, really good opportunity for us to find the issues with deploying 5G in an environment like ours. So I'll say here are some of the initial challenges. The first one is device availability. So good industrial devices that are hardened and available for our shop floor are very difficult to come by. And so we're looking for, for, for people to partner with for, for equipment that we can deploy on our shop floor. And, and at the moment, that's very much a kind of build it and they will come mentality. People haven't deployed 5G yet, so a lot of the, the devices aren't available. I should probably also point out that there are other wireless technologies. And whilst we're, we're focusing here in Dunton on 5G, there are other parts of the Ford Motor Company that are looking at different technologies. We know that Wi-Fi will advance with the Wi-Fi 6 standard. And there are plenty of other more bespoke ways of doing wireless communication that we might well find useful in our facilities. So we're also looking at pros and cons of the different technologies. 5G concerns. Well, we know, for example, that, 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 that people are concerned and worried about 5G. We don't have anything to back that up in terms of physical evidence. But these are people's workplaces. This is where they work. They don't have big amounts of choice as to whether they come into those workplaces. So we need to assure them that they're safe. So we'll be putting the health and safety of our employees first and making sure that we can allay all their concerns. And then finally, this is a, di a very different world for us. You know, we're, we're manufacturing engineers used to uh, the, the, the kind of technologies to put things like engines together. And here we are working in new spaces and we're definitely working in new ways. So our background, our ability to understand the telecoms world, your world, is, is certainly something that's stretching us. And that's 
what this type of project is all about. So it's a great opportunity. Um, we're really pleased to be part of it. I've spoken about some of the challenges. Um, you can see from the bottom of the slide, we have lots of partners, but we also have, would like to work with other people. So if you feel like you have uh, any uh, anything to contribute, we'd be more than glad to hear from you, both myself and, and my counterpart, Chris at Vodafone. And with that and the final slide, I'd just like to say thank you very much and, and uh, I hope you have a very good conference. Thank you very much, um, Mark and Chris, for that fantastic presentation, which I think really gave some really nice insights on um, bringing Industry 4.0 to life with 5G. So thank you. Right, we have the results of the first poll now um, with the question, what do you think is the network model that most manufacturers will want to deploy? And leading um, is a hybrid model with 63% of participants saying that they think a hybrid model where uh, more than one of those deployment options um, will be uh, utilized. Behind that, we have a standalone private network at 19%, network slices at 14%, and public network at 4%. So some really interesting results there. And I think it shows how it's not just um, a case of using one option or another and actually different deployment types um, will suit different use cases and different enterprises, strategies and requirements. Right, that brings us to our second keynote. So I would like to welcome Ronan Labras of Orange and Stefan Gervais of Lacroix Group to give their keynote presentation. Hi everyone, thanks very much uh, for this opportunity and I'm very glad to be here. So my name is Stefan Gervais. I'm taking care of a strategic innovation within LACRA Group. Maybe some of you already, uh, we say, um, attended the, the speech I gave a couple of months ago, and now uh, here we are, we're testing the 5G in our factory. I'm going to try to introduce very, very quickly what we're doing. Um, so we're on an electronic manufacturing uh, EMS with a couple of factories, uh, uh, one, only one in France, but also in Germany, North Africa, and Americas. But also, we are also designing our own IoT products for uh, smart cities and for uh, managing environment. So we are mid-cap companies with 4,000 people. On the next slide, everything starts, indeed, our journey on 5G start with uh, on one opportunity, uh, which is uh, we are we dare to have a greenfield electronic manufacturing plant uh, in France, which is uh, pretty daring, I would say. Our CEO uh, took the risk, um, and uh, so we had uh, the chance to uh, re-architecture, to re-infrastructure uh, everything, and to rethink everything as well. And what we did uh, also, we announced a, a co-innovation with Orange. Uh, to test uh, the 5G within our existing factory in order for next year to uh, implement and deploy what we can do with this technology on our new uh, factory. Go so straight to the use case. Maybe yeah, we are we identify a couple of use cases uh, that we are testing just now. We got the 5G uh, deploy uh, three or four weeks ago, not long time ago, of course. So the first thing first is really on our side to make a comparison between uh, what we have today, which is mainly LAN and some other te technologies, and what can 5G do in terms of really um, uh, RF and, and the protocol and the security and, and so on and so forth. So we want to make a real, a real comparison first. Then what do we do in parallel, because we are also designing our own products, right? So we want to uh, add 5G connectivities to the our uh, products, which is doing the energy monitoring for the wall um, factory, and add different type of sensors, IoT sensors as well, and see how it works compared to existing technologies as well. So what you can see at the middle here, uh, it's um, optical inspection, automatic optical expansion, where we are spending a lot of time for all type of uh, default uh, which has, uh, are detected uh, locally. So what we wish to do is to send all this default, you know, uh, we say um, cloud for more uh, AI type of, of processing, so we can reduce drastically all the time we are wasting on the on this optical inspection and, and to focus on real default. So this is definitely one of the key step of uh, of uh, I would say money spending on this. 
And what we are exploring also is at the bottom, this is uh, these automatic guided vehicles uh, that we are having today, and we are going to deploy even more for on an, our next uh, plant. We want them to have a dynamic um, uh, planning, uh, dynamic uh, session which can be changed. Uh, and today, the technology doesn't allow this uh, to do that. So 5G, we hope and we believe that will help to analyze better the, uh, the video and, and to take control maybe even remotely of some HGV and to update also the learning of this HGV as well. The last one on the top is uh, we are already experimenting the uh, augmented reality for uh, helping some of the operators uh, and uh, we want to try uh, also to see if uh, 5G can help to do it better in more uh, reliable way and a faster way and um, maybe also to expand what we can do with this uh, combined technology of augmented reality. Ultimately, what we expect and we, we hope is to have a much more secure and real-time monitoring of the wall factory. This is our, one of our, our goal on this one. I try to be a bit, a bit concise to put everything on one go. So what do we expect on 5G? We expect a lot indeed because we have a big challenge with a new factory. We need to re reinvent completely the way we are doing manufacturing to be much more flexible. So flexibility, adaptability with mobility, we want to move uh, the machines as well and everything. So uh, that's what uh, we expect 5G to, 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 to help us on this one. Of course, and speed, and I think you know that speed is very key in our industry, especially with a lot of customization. Um, we need to have a higher speed of decision with much more information and much more data. So. Uh, that we can get higher reliability, which indeed imply quality, higher quality, security, and redundancy in communication. The way we can uh, do all of that, um, and increase of the flawless of for, uh, information for optimum decision. Decision can be key and can make the, the difference between making money or losing money in, uh, in in this type of business as well. So I don't want to go too on on everything, but uh, the we want to really to achieve the best efficiency uh, combined with the best flexibility with a dynamic automatization. It means that we, we need to adapt each time the way we automatize everything. We also have some expectation on sustainability uh, to limit the carbon emission of the energy and water consumption to decrease the maintenance also, uh, but also give more valuable job to our to our worker, right? To have uh, so to get more automatized. Uh, we see basic tasks, so our operators are, are going to do a better job. By the way, we are going to hire more people in the next factory, so it's not going to take uh, jobs on this one. We dream that this uh, can transform the full value chain in, in many on the forecast or during in stock, but this is, uh, we say, a, another big topic as well. So just to stop here, what do we expect in 5G? If it's 5G is really fulfilling all what we expect, and it's not what we expect, it's what we need for uh, industry of the future and, and to be uh, competitive, then it means from on our side of first thinking today is that we need definitely a hybrid web network. And even though some of engineers, some of very few engineers prefer to have a private one, we believe and we strongly believe that we cannot do a private and cannot have a private network. We need to work with an operator like Orange to have a kind of dedicated network for specific tasks, uh, especially for all these sensors and, and, and data management and everything, uh, but within a public network. So this is our position today and what's the testing and I will keep you updated on what we do. So please, Ronan, if you want to follow. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. So, uh, so I'll give you, yes, the uh, orange uh, view of this uh, of this project and first of all I will uh, start by uh, going to the uh, next slide and uh, introducing um, who actually in orange was part of this project because um, we are as uh, Stefan said an, an operator but uh, it's actually orange business service who's been involved uh, with uh, with LACRA group in this in this co-innovation co project um, orange business service uh, is actually uh, the enterprise division of, of Orange, and uh, it's been uh, involved in the transformation of the in, of some uh, uh, industry customers in their tra digital transformation. So, in fact, uh, Orange Business Service is. Uh, if you can click on the on the slide. 
for the animation, thank you. It's involved in all the, the data journey uh, that we see uh, important in the digital transformation. And it's uh, capable of uh, offering uh, support and services in all uh, aspects of this data journey from the collect part to the uh, uh, share and create part of, uh, of this slide. So it's also capable of providing technical uh, expertise through consulting, through integration, and uh, also uh, very much in the security aspect, because the more uh, digitized are the process and the manufacturing, uh, the more the security needs to be uh, at the heart of the of the strategy. Um, what we see uh, again, please uh, click on the on the slide. Uh, also, is that in this uh, data journey, 5G is actually going to accelerate uh, the collect part. Uh, it's not the only technology that uh, is, is involved, whether it's wireless uh, technology or, or LAN technology, they already exist in the, uh, in the factory, but it will, uh, through some uh, uh, improved performance, help to uh, accelerate the data journey and make it more instantaneous. And this is in that uh, migration and transformation that uh, Orange Business Service has been uh, interested in, in running this, uh, this uh, uh, co-innovation project, uh, such as the one with the with Lacroix. Um, in terms of um, the different phases of the project, so again through uh, the support of technical experts uh, from uh, uh, different division of, uh, of Orange, uh, we've built this as the co-construction project. Uh, in fact, it's very important uh, and the, from the early phase, so the, from the kickoff in uh, uh, late uh, 2019, uh, to the actual uh, um, build and rollout phase uh, in, on the on the factory floor. Uh, there's been some uh, uh, co cooperation um, and construction of the use case, analysis of the use case, because each use case, as you could see, is different, and especially each use case in their environment is different. So from from one customer to the other, we need to do a very thorough analysis. We need to uh, design together the the scenario of test. And we need, for our, our part, to ensure that the solution that is put in place uh, will actually uh, reach the, the performance expected and uh, enable uh, some conclusions to be made. So we can deploy networks, but it needs to be made uh, in such a way that we will learn uh, through this, uh, this project, whether it's on Lacrosse side or on, uh, on Orange side. Uh, so now we are in this middle uh, phase, uh, which is the, the solutions being installed and uh, the use case will be run uh, for, for a few months. Uh, and then the, the final part, which will be uh, completed in, uh, in Q1 next year, and where we will reach uh, the, the conclusion and, and get some, uh, some lessons that I, I will list in, um, in one of the, the following slides. So in terms of uh, technical solutions, um, as was explained earlier, there's, there are some uh, uh, different uh, architecture proposals that exist. Um, they have some variants as well, so depending on, on the spectrum and the architecture. Um, so for this project with the with Lacroix Group, and based on their um, uh, requirements, um, it's been uh, chosen a scenario three from the 5G Astia uh, um, white paper uh, that was published uh, last year. Uh, this scenario three means that actually the, the radio uh, has been uh, deployed and is shared and it's uh, uh, for all this, the services, uh, but uh, some services are local. So in fact, the user data uh, and the services are run locally, uh, and uh, only the signaling part is uh, is going and connected back to the uh, Orange uh, Core network, which actually for for that uh, particular project is a is a, is the quick co-innovation co uh, core network. And what it allows the this uh, architecture is really to be uh, answering the, the, the needs uh, from the customers because the data is not going out of the factory. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's still, a, uh, in terms of uh, uh, approach and uh, simplicity, it's still relying on uh, core infrastructure that is uh, centralized. And so it's easier to supervise and to maintain the, the SLA that is, uh, that is needed. And uh, in terms of, um, operational aspect, what is needed at the beginning, of course, is to make sure that uh, the split of the traffic between what needs to go out and what needs to stay uh, is well uh, implemented. And that is uh, what was done uh, through the cooperation of uh, um, Orange and is, uh, is uh, 
his suppliers, which was uh, Ericsson for, for this project. Um, in terms of uh, spectrum, so here we are using a temporary uh, spectrum because as you may know, the, the, the license, 5G license in France have not yet been uh, completely awarded. We are in the, in the middle of the process, but it was not awarded at the beginning of the, of the project. So it's a, a dedicated uh, spectrum, but it's a spectrum that is uh, managed by Orange and it's a temporary license with a temporary uh, um, bandwidth that is a bit smaller than what will be uh, the final allocation when the, the process is, uh, is completely uh, uh, done in, in France. So this, this scenario is uh, uh, interesting for us because it's actually uh, one of the, the scenarios that we'd like to be replicated in, a, in other uh, uh, projects, whether in France or in others, because we believe that uh, the reuse of the uh, the, the public uh, networks and the extension of the public network to fit some customer needs is actually the most cost-effective solution and the one that uh, uh, is enabling the full use of the uh, 3.5 gigahertz uh, band. Um, in terms of uh, architecture, so this was based on the NSA uh, architecture, so it's not yet uh, uh, SA uh, uh, enabled. So in terms of our objectives and, uh, and the lesson that we expect from this uh, this project, um, so first of all, is uh, we we need to to understand more the, the get more knowledge from the industry. So we are already uh, partners of some uh, players in the industry sector, but we need to understand from the uh, IT to OT integration aspect uh, what would be the role of uh, of the uh, 5G in their uh, in their uh, use case. Uh, we need to uh, to understand the real needs of customers. So here with Lacroix, we, we could understand the, the needs to keep the local some data. Uh, with other projects that I will talk about later, uh, we've, we've learned other lessons. So we need really to have this intimacy with the customers that allow us to offer the best uh, and, and more efficient solution for their, for their needs. Um, we need to identify uh, the exact role of 5G uh, because there are already existing uh, legacy technology, uh, whether it's Wi-Fi, uh, LAN, or other uh, proprietary solutions, and 5G will not necessarily replace them uh, all. It will complement, we see 5G as complementing existing solutions, so we need to understand when 5G is really needed and when it's not, not necessarily the best solution. So it's, it's quite important uh, uh, to listen to get. And, uh, Importantly, we need to, to get some uh, feedback from the operational aspects of deploying 5G uh, in the industry, and especially when there is indoor coverage uh, concern. So in this project, uh, we had several uh, uh, antenna deployed, uh, espe especially for that uh, factory. Uh, in some case, there would be a mix of uh, coverage coming from the macro networks and coverage from the indoor uh, solutions. So we need to understand how this this uh, uh, will impact the operational uh, running of, of our networks as an operator. Um, so this uh, co-innovation co-innovation project is actually one of uh, of uh, of several projects that uh, has been running uh, in France and in Europe by uh, Orange and especially by uh, Orange Business Service. Um, so factory of the future is of course very important uh, use case, but uh, we've, we've had one uh, also with uh, Schneider Electric, uh, where with some use case around the augmented uh, uh, workers. Uh, we are uh, involved also in the automotive and uh, uh, vehicular uh, domain with a project near Paris with a Tecmo, where we've tested some use case of the uh, autonomous and connected cars. Uh, and uh, we are also uh, providing uh, in, uh, in Belgium the port of Antwerp, uh, a solution to uh, to test some uh, uh, use case around the uh, smart harbor uh, where there are also some use case around uh, industry.0. And the final two use cases are more uh, dedicated to the, the consumer through the, the one use case with SNCF, which is in the station, where we test uh, uh, 26 gigahertz uh, solutions for high-speed download. And the final one with the stadium, where we test uh, the use of 5G to provide some uh, uh, additional uh, experience to the to the sports event viewer. So as you see, uh, with Orange, we see co-innovation uh, as a key aspect of uh, success in 5G. 
because uh, we need to learn from uh, our partners. And I guess what was said earlier, I guess uh, uh, they also need to learn from us on uh, how 5G uh, can uh, fit in their uh, in their transformation, the digital transformation. So thank you very much, and uh, I wish you a good uh, follow-up for the conference. Thank you very much, Stefan and Ronan. Really interesting to hear about your um, innovative work together. And in fact, we've had quite a lot of questions come through as well. So we look forward to uh, working with you after this session and um, spreading even more information. Right, I would like to hand over to Steve Doyner from the GSMA, who will um, moderate the panel session. So we have uh, on the panel, Alexander Dio from DHL, Jakob Groot from KPN, Log Kerr from Verizon, and Marian Bazushin from Shell. Cool. Um, so uh, first question to Log, and uh, it, we've heard a lot about uh, 5G and uh, private LTE. So what do you think are the key benefits of this uh, that you can offer to the manufacturers? Well, Steve, thank you. The whole con this webinar is about the private and dedicated networks. So I'm really pleased to give you our perspective from the Verizon side. Uh, we are seeing fantastic excitement from various industries, including manufacturing. And the thing that they are looking for from these networks uh, in terms of the benefit, one is the an ability to have enhanced capability, enhanced connectivity and coverage which gives them ability for controlling and customizing their uh, manufacturing plans. And of course, you know, it supports the licensed and unlicensed spectrum. So both are very important to them. The second major benefit that they are looking for is the ability to achieve high performance. And what I mean by that is the ability of predictable low latency, which is very critical for automation in the manufacturing plan and also the strong security credentials that uh, these networks offer. Uh, the third one I would say is in the area of seamless mobility, flexibility, it was touched upon in the first panel session also, and the ability to transparently hand over between the macro and the private network in a hybrid scenario is, is very crucial for the customers and then the ability to create different user groups. Last but not least is the ability for new kinds of use cases which have not uh, come up yet. So all together, these are the benefits, I think from uh, Verizon's perspective, we are seeing that the customers like it. Okay, th thanks love. And, and you mentioned use cases there and a question to uh, Alex at DHL. So uh, we've heard about private, public and hybrid networks and, and how do you see those working for different use cases? Yeah, thanks Steve. Um, so right now what we're seeing is that the use of private networks would allow for complicated computing use cases that utilize more of a high bandwidth requiring technologies. So as we look towards factories, uh, in particular, a private network does make a lot of sense or a potentially hybrid uh, network. But as we move towards uh, warehouses in current state, I think the answer pushes towards a, it doesn't make sense current state. Um, moving forward though, there's gonna be a higher dependency with some of these future use cases that will require um, these private networks for drones and robotics in, in warehouses. Okay, thank you. And and um, sim similar kind of question to uh, Shell uh, and Moraine. The so for, from Shell side, what's your strategy for five G deployment? We have very clearly told our facilities around the world that um, we expect them to have four G coverage everywhere in the facilities now and five G as soon as it's available within the um, within the country and area that they operate in. We see um, Wi-Fi connectivity only as an option in our office buildings, basically, not in the facilities itself. Um, based on on the experience that we have gained working with with KPN in the uh, in the field lab here at Pernas Refinery in Rotterdam, um, we've we've decided that we will go uh, public uh, where possible. But in reality, in many cases, that means a hybrid setup with either dedicated bandwidth or dedicated infrastructure to support the needs of the facilities that are typically quite large. Um, we only go to full private 5G in countries and location where there really isn't any other option because we have great experience with the um, with the dedicated uh, 
options on public networks. Okay, thank, thank you. And, and um, going back to the poll, the first poll that we had, and uh, Jakob, I'll, I'll turn to you here. So, uh, hybrid model uh, was the most popular in the poll results. Uh, so, uh, to you, what's the role of non-public in your offering? And um, we've heard recently about 74 licenses in Germany. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, that's an interesting question, uh, Stephen. Uh, hi, Marang. Um, uh, well, long time that we've seen. Um, um, good to hear um, uh, that you're still there. Um, we, we at KPN, uh, we go for a, um, uh, something we call private over public. Um, um, and I, I make some comparisons with um, uh, virtual private networks on a fixed network um, uh, from a time ago. Uh, everybody wanted to have um, uh, dark fibers. Everybody wanted to have uh, and to own their own uh, equipment, etc. Um, uh, until the moment that everybody uh, started to realize mm, that's quite expensive. Uh, you, it eats up all kinds of fiber, uh, the capacity which is in there, um, uh, etc. And there are other means to um, uh, make this all happen. So what's what's important is um, uh, to come back to uh, customer requirements. Uh, what's really necessary um, uh, in order to make it a valuable case, uh, and then in a lot of cases um, um, we found out that our customers want uh, quick um, uh, solutions, uh, connectivity services, uh, etc., that help them forward. Um, uh, they don't have the people uh, always to come up with their own networks, um, uh, etc. Where in in some cases, as at, uh, at Marijn uh, also indicated, it's necessary to build in uh, build in some extra security measures or some extra um, uh, things. So uh, potentially you will end up um, uh, now in in a private net uh, or in a hybrid network. But I think uh, finally everybody will move into um, a more public um, uh, related, where that, where it's really a private over public. And the 74 licenses in Germany, it's very difficult to, um, uh, to comment upon um, and because I, I think the geography and the coverage of mobile networks in, uh, in Germany is completely different um, than what's happening in, um, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, uh, we, we already have 99.4% uh, of geo coverage in the Netherlands with 4G. Uh, we will do the same with, uh, uh, with 5G. I can imagine that uh, some of these factories or facilities are in places where there is hardly any coverage. And that, uh, then, uh, if I would be the customer, I would ask uh, for a for a license as well, and build up um, uh, a great network, which gives me the flexibility, as we just heard from uh, Lacroix Group, uh, from um, uh, DHL, um, uh, Shell, and and Ford. Yep, th thank you, uh, Jakob. And you, you mentioned uh, Teams, and I'd like to turn back to DHL and Alex. And uh, with regard to, do you think that these trials of network solutions are, are going to create um, a, a requirement for Teams being built within industrial organisations, or do, where do you see that mobile operators might be called on to provide support? Yeah, I think um, a quick quip um, from one of my mentors. Oh, in a previous life when I was in the aviation industry was let's not forget to be at the end of the day, we still fly airplanes. And I think that totally applies here that sometimes you need to remember that uh, what industry you're in is where you need to focus your attention. You could build out a team, it could be great, but sometimes finding the right resources, finding those industry experts is what's critical in developing it correctly. So coming from a supply chain 4.0 perspective uh, where DHL sits, it, we need to recognize when it doesn't make sense to create an entirely in-house team. Um, there are industry experts out there, many of them on today's webinar, um, which is great to see. Uh, DHL is uh, the world's leading logistics organization, and we need to know our resources and who to talk to in the organization. However, it's key to know these resources and when to partner for the right solution to be provided. Um, it's difficult to have a company span across an entire value chain, but rather it's beneficial to work in the best in, cl best in class solution providers. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, turning back to Moraine, the what benefits does Shell see from using 5G in your facilities? So the benefits we see over um, over 4G is the ability to create dedicated bandwidth. The, the Pernis refinery I used earlier as an example is surrounded by two major highways uh, where we don't want to be in a situation where if there's a traffic jam and everybody decides to watch a video, we can't monitor our processes anymore. 
Um, the, our facilities are typically very dense, so we foresee, uh, especially coming years, a huge number of, of, of mobile connected devices in the facilities and, and the larger density that 5G allows is a major um, benefit for us. Um, and we see, as we've proven together with KPN, that the, uh, the bandwidth that um, 5G provides uh, enables new use cases. We, we demonstrated we could stream 4K video live from the facility to the clouds to, to analyze it for, um, for defects in the, uh, in the facilities and then stream it back to a, a mobile device in the hands of an end user on the facility. And, and that's, uh, that's something we could never do before. So that is our, the, some real benefits we see. Okay, thank you. Um, now, in, in the second poll, we had uh, security as the top uh, top topic, and 40% uh, of the people were saying that uh, security is most important. And uh, back to Jakob, and uh, security is often considered with regard to 5G standalone. So, um, is is that how you see it working for you? What's the role of 5G standalone in your offering? Um, um, uh, we, we are currently setting up uh, our first experiments with um, uh, with standalone, Steve. And um, uh, security is definitely uh, one of the um, uh, the aspects um, uh, why we want to uh, to set it up. But the second thing is, um, um, uh, if we if if more and more customers come in and and want to have that that private over public um, uh, type network. Then uh, scale is also very important. Um, uh, the level of automa uh, automation, I think, is with um, uh, with a, um, a standalone core much more efficient than you can do with a uh, non-standalone core, um, uh, which is the current architecture. Um, so I, I think that that's uh, extremely important. Um, also to have the real-time delivery of these services, um, um, where somebody um, uh, pops in. Uh, and, uh, and and wants to have 5G connectivity um, um, uh, within a flip of a second because it's important for its um, uh, business processes. Yeah, I think um, uh, everybody needs to 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 make use of the standalone. So um, uh, from a commercial uh, standpoint, as quick as possible. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and I'll turn back to Love now at Verizon again, and um, it, this question really about Wi-Fi and its coexistence with private cellular solutions or hybrid uh, solutions. So, uh, how, how do you see this relationship between Wi-Fi and uh, private cellular uh, solutions here? Yeah, that's a great question, and I must tell you that every time we meet customers, they ask the same question. Uh, Wi-Fi is very pervasive all over the places, whether it's in the manufacturing plants or offices or even at our home, Wi-Fi is pervasive. But we all know that Wi-Fi has limitations, especially there is no guarantee that you will have coverage everywhere. In spite of all the uh, developments that have happened, that spotty coverage is one complaint we hear from customers. And, and when you are in a manufacturing situation, in a plant automation, you can't afford to have party coverage and therefore unpredictable latency. So the question is, what is the alternative? The alternative is the private cellular networks in a hybrid fashion or even in dedicated fashion, whichever works. But I must say that depending upon the use cases customers may have, uh, both or either one of the solutions may, may survive or coexist. What our position is in Verizon, we believe that both technologies will have room to play, they will coexist, but whenever you are looking for a predictability in your uh, services, in your manufacturing, automation, et cetera, et cetera, then you have no better choice other than 5G or 4G based private networks. So that's what you know. I believe will continue for quite some time and may even, uh, both both technologies will stay all together. Right. Yep. And, and, and I think that's a common message there. So thank thank you for that, love. Um, and uh, I I know that we're short on time here. One final question, I think, to uh, uh, to Jakob, um, and it's uh, we, we're all sitting at home at the moment. So what's the impact of COVID on five G value added services from your perspective? Um. Yeah, um, uh, difficult to tell. Um, uh, tonight we will get a press conference of our prime minister, and uh, probably they um, uh, make some some extra measures um, uh, to to um, become effective. Um, but what what I do know is that um, um, 
for instance, uh, the um, uh, one one of our COVID test streets, um, uh, etc. They they're they're um, uh, setting up, set up in several places in the uh, in the Netherlands um, uh, on parking lots, for instance. There is no connectivity, but you need to have that security. You need to have um, uh, the quick setup of them uh, these services, and they all come up um, uh, at the moment and and ask us, um, uh, can you help us? Can uh, you, through your uh, value-added services, the guaranteed bandwidth um, uh, and, and, and the priorities that you can give through that 5G network, can you um, uh, please help us out so that we can make it a si uh, safe environment for customer data, uh, but also to help people forward? So uh, I think um, uh, 5G um, also helps us to uh, to get through this very difficult um, uh, uh, period uh, of, of uh, less um uh travel um uh, where we still need uh, that social contact but also um uh, to keep our, uh, keep uh, us all uh, safe in a in a healthy uh, uh, status okay thank you hey, hey steve if i may add just few sentences on top of what jack said uh covid-19 is causing havoc around the world one of the thing that we are seeing from customers and the solutions we are offering is the need for contactless, touchless experience. Because everybody wants to make sure, can we offer services, be that in manufacturing, retail, or any sector, contactless is the, is the vocabulary that everybody is using. And we have a lot of success in providing those kind of touchless experiences. Great example. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to extend a big thank you to all our panelists um, and speakers. Um, you've made this a really uh, insightful session. So uh, thank you to all our attendees as well. And I'd like to point you in the direction of the GSMA um, 5G IoT for Manufacturing website, where you can find um, our resources, including our 5G private and dedicated network paper. So thank you all for attending and see you next time.